<sighs> hey, I'm so sorry. I don't know. It's just my, my webcam turned black and uh, then I had to reload the page and well, quickly the page stream ended. I'm really terribly sorry. I should know uh, better, better than this. <laughs> How are you, Jose? Everything good? Where are you from, by the way? So to everybody who just uh, joined, um, it's going to be a sourdough session. I made this sourdough. It's my overnight recipe. And uh, I wanted to do the same recipe just on the same day. And I made the dough for this. And I went a little bit higher in terms of water content. And I'll be showing you in this live stream, um, we will be baking, we will be shaping that sourdough. I have to divide it, so I have to pre-shape it. I'll show you how that works. Then I'll show you shaping. And yeah, afterwards, once we're done, we can switch to some nice Q&A, ask me anything sourdough related or whatever you feel like. I hope you have fun and uh, yeah, let's get started. And thanks everybody for joining in and sorry for the trouble before. That was just, uh, I think, I don't know, first time I'm streaming on YouTube. <laughs> I'm just looking down a little bit sometimes because that's where my computer is and my camera is up there. Hi, please. Alicante, Spain, nice. I have never been there, but if I could choose a country where I would move to, then it would definitely be Spain, I think. Hmm. I've been a few times at the south uh, near in Andalusia, so I've been in uh, Jerez. Then I went to um, what was the name? Ronda, I think was the name. Uh, Cadiz, and we also took a nice boat tour to Morocco. That was super nice. I know a very uh, good programmer from there. We met up uh, first time. He guided us a little bit around the city of Tangier. I don't know if you know the cook Anthony Burdain. That was a really an incredible experience. We went to this really small restaurant where you wouldn't expect this is even a restaurant. And then you go inside and it's the best seafood I've ever tasted in my life. It was really incredible. And also in Andalusia in Spain, just the food, it's on another level. Something I always miss in Germany because, I mean, we have bread. But, but we also have some other dishes. Uh, we know how to make beer, but it's not that we care so much in detail about our food. Something I miss a little bit from the Mediterranean states. Hey, Enrico, Hamburg. Hello, nice to meet you. Tanya Porn. That's, okay, I don't know how, how to pronounce the name. I'm so sorry. Moin. Uh, son of Cakes. Hello. Greetings, Israel. How's it going? Anthony Brain. Yes, yes, yes. Hallo, guten Abend. Flowerabend. <laughs> because in German, we say Feierabend, which means... Uh, Work day is over, and he said, flower oven. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to take this now. I'll just turn my camera. Let's, okay, that's me, my belly. Let's have a look now at the dough. <laughs> what? You lived in Germany? Yeah, where did you live in Germany? Hey, Carsten M. Hi, Poey. Hey, Tom. <laughs> going everybody thanks for joining in all right so this is the dough and um, I can't stress this enough how important temperature is temperature is always really a, a core factor and what I always like to do I recommend this to everybody I like to take a small piece of the dough and I always mark the jar with a rubber band like this now if I turn this you can't really see because the dough is going to um, rotate but basically this has uh, doubled in size. So this dough is very good. It's, it's around 1,000 grams of dough. So it's quite a lot of dough. And um, let me just show you. It's around 26 degrees Celsius here. Uh, so that's also the same temperature as in the kitchen. So fermentation is relatively fast at this uh, level of temperature. I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah. Is it a flash shirt? Yes, it's a flash shirt <laughs> in Aachen. So everybody, Aachen is a really nice city in Germany. They have one thing which is called stinky water. And basically it's connected to a source uh, in the city and it's coming, it has volcanic origins. And um, if you drink it, well, it smells like poo basically. Well, it's made, it smells very sulfuric, like rotten eggs. 
but it tastes normal. <laughs> it's always a challenge in Aachen to drink some stinky water. And uh, just wanted to show you this. So this is a dough which I made uh, yesterday. Um, this was my overnight dough. And you can see it increased a lot in size already. And I just wanted to show you what happens. This dough is definitely overproofed. So just have a look at how this dough is likely going to, you see this, how it's collapsing at my finger because this dough can't hold the strength anymore. It's also likely way too sour. So sourdough baking is really always about finding the sweet spot between not too much fermentation and not too little fermentation. So yeah, fermentation is really the one key thing that you have to master. I mean, it's the same when making wine, kimchi, and all the other things. So yeah, fermentation is really important. Um, <laughs> your nostrils are not stimulated, please. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I actually got a dough. Uh, I got a joke for you. Uh, what what do you call a bitter dough? A sour dough. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Anyways, <laughs> let's uh, have a look at this dough. What always works when you have sticky dough? This one is around, I would say, seventy seven percent in hydration. So seventy seven grams of water per uh, one hundred grams of flour. This is ready and I have to remove this from the container now and I always use water. Water works very well. So just in comparison here, you can see how much it sticks to my hand, but with water I can just remove like this from the edge of the container a little bit. Normally what I do is I would just take it out of the container and shape it directly. That way you would get a little bit more of an open crumb. But in this case, this does not work because it's two loaves. So I have to separate them. And that means I have to pre-shape -shape it. Now I'm doing the classic coil fold one more. <laughs> Thank you so much, son of the cakes. That means a lot. So let me go in here now. Very, very jiggly dough. It's super satisfying to work with this kind of dough. <laughs> so let's go in here and we will just be flipping this dough over like this. That way I can just remove it from the container. You want to have is I will remove I will move this with my hands it starts to stick a little bit so that you can see this a little better so this is the base dough and for this you want to have a dough scraper let me just find my <laughs> my dough scraper yeah this one has 77% hydration roughly but it's really really nicely nicely inflated I always use my tools. <laughs> Dough scraper. Oops. Gotcha. Dough scraper. <laughs> so um, give your dough a good tap. That's always very important. <laughs> and now I'm going to divide this into two pieces. And then we have to do the pre-shaping. Now, if you just make one bread at the same time, you don't have to do this. And I recommend you to also do that at the start because pre-shaping is a rather tricky process. Um, when you pre-shape, you also uh, round up the crumb inside of your bread a little bit. Because when you pre-shape, you pull the dough over the surface and this evens out the crumb. So if you have an issue where you have a too wild crumb and you want that to be a little bit more evenly spread, then pre-shaping is definitely the way to go. And now with a dough scraper, with a swift movement, we have to separate this dough, okay? So what I like to do is I just, just like to mark this roughly so that I know where I have to cut. And then I just go in here and with swift movement, pull this apart. 
sorry for that. <laughs> so now I have two pieces of dough. The problem is I can't shape a piece of dough like this. It has to be round. So what I have to do is I have to shape this into a round ball. And this is what's called pre-shaping. And I will show you this. I always normally try this with a dough scraper, but let me just try and hope I succeed with my bare hands. I've never done this actually with my bare hands, but I figured he want to have something to, to laugh at when, when I fail. So I just go in here and I take the dough and I use the surface. I use the dough, I use the surface to pull the dough because I know the dough is sticking here at the bottom of the surface, as you can see. So I'm using that to round up the dough. So I go in here and pull this over the surface. Go in here, pull. Go in here, pull. And look at this. <laughs> this actually worked much better than I expected. Uh, yes, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be shaping two batards in the end out of those. And I will be using one with a linen inside. Somebody of you corrected me, it's linen, not linen. So with a linen. And the other one I will just place inside like this. So actually this went much better than I expected. So I'm sorry, not that interesting probably. And now I will be using the other, uh, we'll be doing the other dough with my bench scraper. At a 45 degree angle, go inside and pull. And push and pull, push and pull, push and pull. And I have failed so many times at this. That's why I never recommend somebody who tries to get started in baking to, to do this. Pull, push and 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 pull. Now I can also take this and just... So, so, um, <laughs> so Jose, yes, that was an action question. So yes, this is going to be two batards. Um, David, excellent question. Um, you can go much tighter. Actually, what we can do is just for science, just to visualize, I can post a picture later on. I will leave this like this dough like this with a knot type pre-shape. And what I'm going to do with this dough I will shape it, I will uh, pre-shape it much tighter. And this is going to give a little bit of extra strength. So if you did not need enough or so, this could be good, but it's also going to even out the crumb a little more. So crumb wise, this one is going to be more open and this one will be a little tighter. So let's just go here and make this a little tighter. So much tighter pre-shape than this dough, as you can see, right? Look at those nice signs of fermentation here. <laughs> uh, Phil, well, push and pull like six. I, <laughs> uh, I don't know about that. Depends a little bit on you, I guess. I just pull. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please, thank you so much. Uh, take care. Um, have a good one. Greetings uh, to Malaysia. Thanks for joining. Take care. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah, actually, <laughs> deranged rabbit. Nice username. Um, this now has to rest, and this now has to rest because um, we put the gluten and work very tightly together, and now we could not shape it. We want this to elongate a little bit. This is called a bench resting, what we do right now. We want the gluten to elongate a little bit so that we have a bigger surface area, which we can then fold on top. So like this, we can't really glue the dough together. So that's why we need this to spread out a little bit. And this can take anywhere from five minutes to 15 minutes. I would say the dough should be probably here in order for me to uh, shape it. 
Now, sometimes you might just want to completely skip that and shave it right away if you see that your dough is a little bit too runny or so. <laughs> Tom Nelson. Yes, you can, definitely. You can overstretch the gluten network and then your dough is just going to t tear here on top of it. Um, like here, you will get some cracks. This happened to me as well. So while we are waiting, <laughs> let's do some uh, Benetton work. So Benetton, Gerkorb in the German, Gerkorb. <laughs> Uh, aus Pedigrohr, this is the word, don't ask me how this is uh, called in English. <laughs> uh, we need to prepare this, and there's two options that you have. You could just be using it like this, then you would get this nice flower pattern on top, but in my opinion, you also have to be a little bit careful because sometimes um, some people use too much flour, or you can use a linen like this, which is really good because it's going to be less sticky, but then you don't get this nice pattern. If you have a relatively stiff dough, I would say 65 to 70 percent hydration, I would opt for this because here the dough can uh, not will not stick. But if you have a wet dough, then chances are it's going to stick here to the wooden area. Then I would definitely be opting for this option here. So depending on how much hydration you have, I would choose either this uh, Benetton or I would choose this Benetton. But just to check, because I've never I've never used um, a Benetton with around 77% hydration. I just wanted to test it because I feel this dough is fermented just right and it's also not going to stick. So I feel comfortable in just trying this because also the, the more you fermented your dough, the more it in, is inflated and the less of a surface area you have when you touch it. So a nicely fermented dough is also going to stick way less. Son of the Cakes, let me read. Did you try it? Son of the Cakes asks, did you try it with and without bench rest? Are the results significantly different? I, I couldn't tell you significantly based on my personal opinion, yes. Because right now like this, I wouldn't be even be able to shape the dough because which shaping technique would I um, employ? I could just turn it over and then use a, try to shape it into a boule but shaping it in a batara like this, it's hardly possible. So I wouldn't even know how to do it right now. Also, the dough would very likely just pull back, I feel. When I have a very, very high hydration dough, which is very runny, which is hard to handle, then I don't pre-shape. I would directly try to shape it out of the container. But now in this case where I'm bulk fermenting what it's originally actually about. You bulk ferment multiple doughs, that's what you do in a large bakery, then there's no way without pre-shaping. Hope this answered your question, son of the cakes. <laughs> son of the cake. <laughs> Kane, David Buchan, Kane. Okay, that's the, the English word we were looking for, Kane. <laughs> uh, yes, Joss, that's actually a valid point. Joss said, okay, if you don't have a linen, and if you don't have a band hand, you can always just use a bowl and use a kitchen towel inside. That's also going to work. Brian Ranucci, hello. Hello to Argentine. How's it going? <laughs> Mike Lyons, hello. 812 flour in Germany, equivalent to bread flour. So, yes, in Germany, we specify flour based on when you burn it, how many grams of ash are remaining. So, when people say, when Mike Lyons asks, 812 flour, that's 812 milligrams of ash remain after you burn the flour. Now, what this means is the higher the number is, the more minerals you have inside. Um, and cake flour would be, would be the lowest amount because that's just the starch part of the seed. And the higher the number, the more parts of the seed are inside. And um, just to clarify, because people have asked me this many times, Bread flour is just all-purpose flour with added gluten. So when you see a flour which has more than 12% protein, it's I've never seen a flour that has natural this amount of protein. It's very likely that you have added gluten, especially if you have an all-purpose flour or a bread flour. Now, if you have a whole wheat flour, then that's a different story. But um, so to answer your question, the bread flour would be type 550 in Germany with uh, added gluten, basically. <laughs> Hope this made, made sense. 
Jose, yes. So, yes, so he said high hydration dose, excellent. Yeah, I can only repeat what he said. Um, don't try don't try to do it for high hydration loads. It's going to stick. And uh, yes, I, I think the moment I'm about to bake them, I'm, I'm going to think of what you said and said, yes, Jose told me so. But just for trying, for, for science, I'm just going to do it, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, peeps. Pai Lin Chu, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. How's it going? Brian, awesome. Yeah, glad you're bacon, bacon from Argentine with people from all around the world here. That's super awesome. Uh, Tom Nelson, no, spelt should not contain more gluten. Well, modern spelt is very similar to wheat, so you can, in many recipes, just replace wheat with spelt, but traditional spelt is an older grain. It shouldn't have as much gluten. Joss S, he adds uh, vital wheat gluten. Yes, it is. That's exactly. Either you buy a bread flour or you take an all-purpose flour and just mix in a little bit of gluten. That's definitely something you can do. Not bought. So um, I'm not being lazy. Well, I'm sometimes very lazy, just like in the last video when I slept for too long. Sorry, shame on me. But I'm just waiting for this to elongate a little bit so that I can shape it, just so that everybody knows I'm not just uh, about being lazy and uh, drinking a beer. Hmm. So, not bought. Not bought ass. What changes when you proof in the fridge for eight hours versus 24 versus 20, 72 hours? Well, so. This is not proofing. This was the bulk fermentation stage. And now afterwards, it's going to start proofing. Now, in proofing, we build the structure into our dough. And now we want that dough to inflate a little bit more, to increase in size. Proofing is done when your dough passes the finger poke test. I actually have a video on this upcoming very soon where I'm just comparing different proofing methods. But pretty much over a period of, I would say, 12 hours or so, the fermentation process almost completely comes to a stall instead of your fridge. So depending on the temperature in your fridge, 24 versus 72 hours might not even make a difference anymore. Because I think the minimum temperature for yeast activity is six degrees Celsius. Now don't quote me on this please, but over time it's just going to be uh, almost no activity anymore. But also one thing to notice, the level where you place uh, the dough to proof in the fridge. On the top, it's typically warmer than at the bottom. I also had this happen to me recently. <laughs> uh. Biker tea, what beer is it? It's um, Ratsherren, which is a brewery from Hamburg. I am from the North. I'm from Hamburg. <laughs> and we are saying Moin in Hamburg. That's the way how we greet people in Hamburg. <laughs> uh, so... Hope that answered your question, Biker T. And hello to South Africa. <laughs> Mr. Benebeki, don't you use 720 flour? I, sorry, um, I, I did not, 720 flour, you mean German 720 flour? No, I don't use that. I just use type 550. <laughs> and um, so, Jos Jose, Kölsch or Alpia? You know your stuff. That's a typical beer for the area of around Düsseldorf or Cologne. Um, no, this is Pilsner style brewing. So uh, in the cave of Pilsen, I don't know if you know the story, Pilsen is a city in the Czech Republic and they actually on average drink, <laughs> <laughs> and they on average uh, drink, I think 200 liters of beer per year. And there they discovered uh, beer brewing in the city of Pilsen, where it's very cold inside of the caves. So if you ever make it to Europe, I recommend to uh, check this out. Peter HH, moin, moin, moin. So the answer to moin, moin is just moin, because normally I would never say moin, moin. Tiago <laughs> BF, como estás? So Tiago is an old colleague of mine. What's the deal, though? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get it? What's the deal, though? <laughs> Rizzle Menizzle. Hallo aus der Nice. 
Nope, I don't know this special kind of beer. He's asking for a peasant bread. I've never made a peasant bread. I don't know about this. Maybe you can uh, just write it in German and I'm happy to translate to the others. Poe pose, yes, 200 liters per capita. I think in Bavaria, it's um, around 220 liters per capita per year on average. <laughs> so it's quite a lot. <laughs> Big limb. Hello from Czechia. How's it going? We were just talking about Pilsner style beer and how awesome Czech beer is. Uh, Mr. Benemicki, type 720 flower. Hmm, okay, no, I've never used it. Um, I have used type 1050, which would be, it's not the whole wheat, but it's a little bit less. So some parts of the brand have been removed. I've baked with it, yes. But I feel, why not just go for a whole wheat flour then directly? Big blue sky, greetings from England. He Hello, Beck. Could you give me a wah, please? A wah. <laughs> uh. um, Joss S. Yes. So Joss S. has been asking a great question. I've wondered about this myself. When we bench rest, wouldn't it be better to cover them so they don't dry out? Yes, it would. But in this case, we're just bench resting for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So this is totally okay to, to do it like this. Um, but yes, if you do longer, there's a danger of your dough just drying out. Hope this answered your question. Jose. Oh, yes, Jose actually did a val very valid point. So when you keep opening up the fridge, you always reduce the temperature all the time and that could lead you to danger zone. Yes, definitely. One of you suggested me to try proving at room temperature until you pass the finger poke test and then just putting into the freezer until the temperature of the dough, right now it's 21 degrees, no 22, until the temperature of the dough reaches um, 10 degrees Celsius. And I tried this with great success a few times. It's also going to be part of my next YouTube video that I'm making. Really good strategy. So proof until it passes the finger poke test and then to the fridge. <laughs> All right, okay, I think we can get started with shaping. I'm just going to be preparing my uh, bannetons. And what I will do is I will be adding some uh, whole rice flour, which is just rice, which I around myself because here I'm not using a linen I have to be adding a little bit more flour as you can see one trick you can do here you can just do like this oops and now you put your rice flour here and then when you place the dough it's going to absorb all that rice flour it's always better to use a little more than two less because you can always brush this off before baking. Just going to put this to the side. I need to have a little more space. And only now, only now is the moment where we are allowed to use flour. We are not using any flour before. Now is the moment where, you use, where we use flour. Uh, Poi Poisy, have you made uh, <laughs> uh, have you made sourdough brötchen? Yes, I have made brötchen, and I wanted to do another video on this at some point. Actually, I can recommend to everybody try making some bread rolls because you get to practice this many, many more times, and you just don't have one big piece where you fail. But you can actually experiment a little bit more. And Biker T, he lived in Bayern in Bavaria, and he says two hundred twenty liters of beer is accurate. I mean, yes. Whenever I go, I always for sure drink a mass of beer. That's always. <laughs> but also, just side note, there have been some breweries which have been brewing beer for a thousand years. So it's a really, really long tradition. <laughs> Biker tea, yes. Um, yes, you can just uh, crush rice to make rice flour, but you have to hit it very hard. I actually have a small mill where I just mill it. That's definitely something you can do. Yes, Jose, exactly what you said. When you're in a hurry, 30 minutes, that's actually, I, I like this method more because it's more, I feel it's more consistent. So now is the moment where I'm going to be using 
some uh, flour. And only now I'm going to use flour. I will not be using too much, just a little bit, okay? Um, Anderson, uh, have you cooked bread with honey? He's asking. So bread with honey, um, you can do it. You can use sugar, you can use honey. The thing it's going to do is it's going to speed up the fermentation process. That, so that's something to keep in mind. Everything will be a little bit faster, but when you just take a small jar like I did here um, and mark this, then it's going to be the same. Just wait until your dough doubled in size and then it's ready to be shaped like we're doing right now. Okay, I just need to make some room. So sorry for that. Sorry, everybody. I hope you did not die. Ah, okay. Quick focus on this. I will answer the questions in a bit. I will take this now with my uh, bench scraper and I will place this here on the flour and then I can start to shape it. So it's now stuck to the surface. That's what I know. So I have to go below and remove it from the surface and then flip it over. This side here has to be now on the flower bed because this side is going to be the top in the end. I don't want this side to be destroyed. So go inside, rotate a little, take this, flip this over on the flower bed. Now, what I'm doing is I'm just elongating this, what a word, elongating, just elongating this a little bit. And I'm going to take this and what I will do now is you see this sticks, right? This is very, very sticky. And this is what we want. The bottom is not sticky because there we have flour. This is sticky. And now by, by uh, taking this and putting this into the middle, this is going to hold together. It's going to be glued together pretty much. And then I will also do this from the other side and that's what shaping is about. Now there's many different shaping techniques, but what you wanna know about shaping is that you wanna to touch your dough as little as possible. The more you touch your dough, the more you are going to deflate your dough. Well, this is already the tightly pre-shaped one. So this is likely already a little bit condensed, but yeah, the less you touch your dough, the better. So I will now take this and I will put this here into the middle and I'm folding this down. And you see how this is now sticking here? Perfect, so this is holding its shape. Now I will take this other sticky side and I will take this and I will fold this over. And then I will make this sticky side here stick to the bottom. Now, the less flour you use, the easier, the easier you can make the bread stick. In this case, I probably used a little bit too much flour. But at the same time, it also becomes more difficult to handle because your dough is also then more sticky. So this is now the base dough. We, uh, we glued it together. And now what I will do is I will take the dough and I will roll it upwards until I have a nice dough roll, pretty much. <laughs> What's the German for elongating Dale? Uh, Verlängern. <laughs> Beachy friend Canada. Hello. Hello to Canada. Que pasa? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Poe, yes, but then you learn from each piece when you bake bread rolls. So, bread rolls, you fail more. <laughs> You're going to fail more. And that's why this is better. <laughs> Michael, you went to a wine fest and every time my beer ran out. <laughs> so he was around in Germany and a random German would always hook him up with some beer. This sounds very, very German. Uh, they'll be Verlängern, yes. Okay, so now. Sergio, hello. Como estas? So I take this and I tuck this down like this, okay? So this is the first move. Now here, my hands are a little bit floured now. I go in here, I push this out and I roll this down. Push, roll, push, roll, push, roll, push, roll, push, roll, push, roll, push, roll. And now we go with our basic shaped uh, bread. So this is already the shaped bread pretty much. And now this here, you can see this is not looking so nice, but what you can do is you can just go in here and tuck this down like this to close it. Same thing here. And now the less flour you used, the easier this is going to be. 
And actually, I'm just going to be using a little bit of water now. Come on, hold together. Yeah. So the problem now is that F, when I shaped the dough, I was I did not let the dough rest enough, so uh, it was not even out. And it caused a little bit of this problem. But this is no problem. Have a look. This is now not looking so nice, but what I'm just going to do now is I'm just going to use the, the bench scraper to round up the dough a little bit. See? Look at this nice piece of dough. <laughs> uh, so if you don't, if you don't tuck it, um, then you might have a little bit of a swirl in the end in the oven. So let me just show you. Here you can see this a little bit, right? So this cracked open up during uh, the oven. And this is actually also where the place where I tuck this together. So then this is going to just burst open a little more in the oven. Gabriel Gomez, hello. Jose, yes, Jose is right. Jose, we should meet up for an epic uh, uh, bread baking session together I feel in Spain and Alicante where I've never been. <laughs> and I'm now going to just be dusting some additional flour, give your dough a good magic massage. This magic massage is really going to make the difference. Your dough is now like, mm, oh, oh, so nice. Thanks for taking care of me. <laughs> <laughs> and now is the magic moment to take it and place it inside of the banneton. So I'm just going in with my dough scraper. I can turn this around and put this good looking dough to a rest. Give it a good tap. Thank you, Mr. Dough. Please make me amazing bread. Sergio Semolina, um, all about my dog. Yes, you don't have to be using rice flour. You can also just be using regular flour. That's no problem, which works when you have a rather stiff dough, stiff dough uh, with maybe less than 70% hydration. But if you're using more water, then rice flour just works better, making sure that it does not stick. But you can also just use regular flour, no problem. So, <laughs> Karen Roats, yes, I do bake bread every day probably, just for learning. And also thank you everybody for watching my videos and supporting me. Um, it's just such an amazing hobby. And I've actually, uh, so end of this year, I'm just going to quit my, my regular job. Um, and I will just take a few months off and I've applied to a couple of local breweries just for fun, just to see uh, how it's like to work in a big bakery on scale. Uh, so that would be my dream. So I'm just trying to pursue my dream end of this year. And I'm very excited how this is going to turn out. Kevin Barras, how do you know when it's tight enough? Excellent question. Mm. Depending on how tight you shape, you get more oven spring, but at the same time, you also even out the crumb. So it's a little bit of finding the sweet spot between all the different variables. <laughs> Björn Hartmann, no happy end, please. <laughs> Sergio, hi to Colombia. Que pasa? Como estas? <laughs> How did I get started with sourdough baking? I went to the store and um, I saw the ingredients which are in the bread and I thought, okay, this is, this is wrong. Uh, this can't be correct. And that's how I got started with sourdough baking. I published all my recipes on a programmer website called GitHub. You can still find them there. The project is also called The Bread Code. And yeah, that's how I got into sourdough baking pretty much. Before answering the next questions, first, let me just show you. This dough has nicely elongated and um, the gluten relaxed. And now this is perfect to shape, but you can see it also dried out a little bit. But yeah, one more time, I go in with my dough scraper rotating this, and now I'm flipping this over. I'm spreading this out a little bit again so that I can, um, so that I can uh, uh, shape this a little bit better. I have a bigger surface area, which means 
I can make the dough stick better to, together. And now there's also different shaping techniques, but the one which I showed you before, and this one I feel is the easiest. There's also other shaping techniques. They all do pretty much the same, but this one is really easy and it works excellent when you want to uh, have an open crumb bread. So I'm taking this, putting this down right here. Taking the other side, making it stick right here. And just look at how, how nice and fluffy this dough is. This is a really good fermented dough. And also in comparison, I can already see the difference between this one here, which we tightly pre-shaped, and this one. This one is just so much more wobbly. And now again, go out, push this over, roll. Give it a good tap, very, very important. Just going to close this one more time, also from the other side so that you can see. Huh. Nope, this does not want to close because I used too much flour. So what am I thinking now? It does not close. So the problem is because I used too much flour, the dough won't uh, the dough won't stick together. So that's what I was why I was struggling a little bit. Um, this is typically <laughs> the five the five minutes where I'm always most focused because here either everything works or <laughs> you screw everything up. You probably have been there too. Um, Shaping is always a little bit of a of an issue, also for me. So just look at how nice and fluffy this dough is. This is really looking very, very excellent. I'm now also going to dust this with some more flour because I don't want this to stick to the banneton. All right. So I'm, this is 77% hydration, so rather wet dough, but I just wanted to test whether I can also bake this just using a default Benetton, no line and cover. Flip this over and gently put this dough here to the rest. <laughs> so two good looking doughs, um, they are ready. So they are ready. They are ready to be baked when they pass the finger poke test. I'll have a video on this upcoming soon, but I'll, let me already show you. So you just take your finger, you put it here into the dough. And do you see this dent here? When this dent only very, very, very slowly recovers, then you are ready to make this bread. So this is still going to require some more proofing. In my case, it's typically around two hours. And now I'm going to follow the the uh, suggestion Jose suggested, because I tried it yesterday and it works very well. I will take this until it passes the finger poke test. And then I will take this and put this into the freezer until the dough temperature here for 30 minutes reaches around uh, seven degrees Celsius or so. That makes it easier to score. But proofing is always done when it passes the finger poke test. This is really a very reliable way to say, yeah, it's done proofing. <laughs> All right, so, okay, let me go through the questions. I'll just put this to the side, clean up a little bit. All the love from Texas. <laughs> uh, all about my dog. Yes, sourdough bread making is just amazing. It's a great hobby. I just, it gives me so much joy. And it's, it seems so easy because the ingredients is just flour, water and salt, but then in the end, it's actually quite complicated. I like to use a plastic bag like this. Keeps the dough hydrated. I reuse the plastic bags all the time, of course. Just quickly going to wash my hands. So 
So, <laughs> just putting this to the side a little bit. And now I'm going to use this. And now I'm going to take the camera. Hello, everybody. And I'm just going to put the camera here. So, nope. I need to get some more professional gear, I guess. So hi everybody, thanks for streaming, thanks for joining, thanks for streaming in. I hope you learned something. And let me just quickly read through the questions that you had. So uh, Jose, bread development over software development. Mm. I love software development really by heart. I've been an engineer for 14 years by now. And it's just amazing. I, I love engineering, especially working with data. I love to work with lots and lots of data. But sometimes, I don't know, these days, I sometimes feel a little overwhelmed with the internet and all the different information and things like that. And to me, after using my brain all day long uh, for to engineer something, it's just so nice to get go back to basics and just have some something so simple as to work a nice piece of sourdough. So it really helps me to calm and it's very nice. At the same time, I'm also being a little bit geeky engineering style about it. So that's uh, pretty cool. That's also where my username comes from, the bread code, basically coding together uh, the bread. Viper Helix, your dough is looking on point today. Good. The dough is strong with you. <laughs> 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 um, Claudia Hoffman, thanks a lot for your amazing video. So you have a flower I should try from Portugal. Soon planning to bake some bread there. Claudia Hoffman, how's it going? Actually, baking attempts in Portugal have not been so successful because it just was just way, you see here? It's 34 on my skin. And in Portugal, it was 34 in the kitchen. So everything was just way, 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 way faster. And I didn't make, manage to make a good sourdough loaf in Portugal. And I switched to using some yeast. And um, <clears throat> I just got me some whole wheat flour from the store. Farina integral, I guess, in Portuguese. I used that to uh, make, some, make some bread. Yeah, that was, was nice. And I always like to bake with a poolish, which is a yeast-based pre-ferment. <sighs> so yeast baking is one thing, but baking with poolish... It's so different than sourdough, but at the same time, the recipes are also very similar, but the taste is just completely out of this world. I love making Polish-based breads. You just take a little bit of flour, some water. It's a one-to-one -one flour water ratio. Put in some yeast, let that ferment for 24 hours, and you mix that in your sourdough uh, recipe. Just replace the sourdough part with the Polish. Super, super good. Hope you have fun in Portugal. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. I have to, oh. <laughs> sorry, I'm so slow with the answers. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm just trying to keep up. You are all amazing, by the way. Uh, burp, 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 burp. Are you using regular bread flour on the dough, Biker T asks? Yes, um, I'm just using regular flour on the dough. That's totally okay. You can also be using bread flour I actually have a small jar here, which I call Opfamir. I don't know if you can see this. My neighbor inspired me because he has a box. He loves to do woodwork. He has a box which he calls um, Opferholz. And this is Opfamir. This is where all my scraps of flour go into. I store them. You see the German is strong on me, the, the label making. And I just take that. I take the flour which I have left on the counter and I use that the next time. So uh, I just probably use the shit, not the shit, it's the worst flour possible for shaping. <laughs> and okay, Tom Nelson, look for white flour. Tom Nelson, yes, white flour, 12% protein. That's a good flour to make sourdough, indeed. Um, all about 
my dog, after you put in the fridge, how many hours do you let it sit in room temperature before putting in the oven? Excellent question. You wanna take your dough and you wanna take the dough and put it directly into the oven because um, your dough is rather stiff from, from uh, the cooling down. And this makes it very easy to score the bread. Scoring is what, it's, what is required to get a nice ear like this. What you do is you take the dough and you cut it at a 45 degree angle before uh, baking. And that way this, this edge here is rising upwards during uh, the baking time. And now when your dough is at room temperature, scoring is sometimes a little bit harder because the dough will just tear. And that's where this fridge trick trick comes into play. The dough is rather stiff because it's cold. And it's easier to cut the dough like this. And uh, yeah, so to get this ear, which I find very beautiful because you have this extra little bit of charring right here. So it gives this unique uh, flavor profile to your bread. You really have to bulk ferment long enough, proof on time. So it's basically, you have to perfect all the parameters and then you're rewarded with this ear. Something that many bakers are striving for. I hope that answered uh, your question. So, um, teach me guitar. How do you, <laughs> where do you store your bread after you bake it? How do you avoid eating a bunch of carbs every day? <laughs> uh, excellent, excellent question. So I try to eat whole wheat if possible. And actually what I like to do is I like to um, also grind some lentil flour from time to time into my bread. I was actually considering making a video on this as well, just making a, I don't know, lentil flour, hemp seed flour based bread or something, something to show you as an alternative. But definitely when you eat bread every day, try getting a little bit more into the whole wheat baking game, where I also just recently uploaded a video on my YouTube channel about whole wheat baking, because then you eat the whole grain, not just part, parts of it. So because all purpose flour is not the whole grain, it's just a tiny part of the grain. So whole wheat is a little bit better in that regard. <laughs> so, Capybaras, you will be done in a flash. <laughs> that was really a good one. You'll be done in a flash. <laughs> so Capybaras asked me, tabs or spaces? So when you compute, when you program, and when you write a line of code, at the start of every line, typically, you put some spacing because to just make it easier readable. You want to write code that's easily readable by others. And now his question is, there's a philosophy, there's just some people who like tabs, which is a pressing the tab on your keyboard literally, or using two spaces instead of tabs. And I'm a spaces guy, I'm not a tabs guy, but I see the benefits also of using tabs. So please don't hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Software dough, Jose. <laughs> yes, we should. We should definitely. You should definitely make a channel software dough. Then we can do it, the bread code meets the software dough uh, collaboration. That sounds amazing. Miriam Dongala Nanga. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I'm sorry if I did not. I beg your pardon. Uh, hello, Midananda. Hello, everybody. I'm a bit late. No, no worries. So we already shaped the dough, it's now resting. I'll be showing you the finger poke test in 15 minutes again, and then uh, this stream is already over, but I think you can also just re-watch it from the start. And if you have questions, feel free to write them in the chat right now. Uh, can you show us how you keep your starter? Vasiliki Sinopoulou. I'm sorry for not pronouncing your name pro probably. I'm so sorry, I'm trying my best. So now this is actually my sourdough, Brad Pitt. He is three years old. And what you might be wondering is, where is all his sourdough? Yes, it's almost all gone because I like to deplete my sourdough. Actually, I will show you just how much I deplete my sourdough. I just go in here and I almost completely empty my jar like this because this way, when I regrow my sourdough, it's going to be less acidic. And this is something that you want because when making sourdough bread, like the one which I showed earlier, 
with an open crumb. It's all about finding the sweet spot and the danger is really to having too much acid inside of your dough. Taste wise, I love the acidic taste, but then that's also going to attack the structure of your dough, which means that you will not get that much of oven spring. So I like to deplete my starter from time to time and just regrow it because then it's also less acidic. Teach me guitar, yeast, cheater, yes. <laughs> uh, yeast is cheating, but sometimes it's also <laughs> quite nice. Uh, yeah, actually that's how yeast was developed uh, by just extracting the yeast from sou sourdoughs pretty much. Because also when you use brewing yeast, people did not know yeast, yeast existed. So what they did is they took a part of the batch from before and put that into, into every new beer making process pretty much. And that way the yeast that had the best evolutionary setup to survive, well survived. And that's how the yeast became better and better and better. And that's pretty much also what happened with sourdough until you then extracted at some point the modern yeast, which you use in bread making. So it's actually quite cool. And just imagine how you are uh, helping uh, fuel a battle inside of your sourdough jar between different yeast organisms that are trying to combat and win against each other. It's like a small war going on inside of this jar all the time. <laughs> Vermicolo, hey man, I've been in trouble with bread texture. It ends up being a little gummy no matter what I do. I've been doing four, okay. Vermicolo, could you please do me a favor and send me a picture over Instagram or so? Then I'm happy to have a look. I can't say exactly, but personally, I don't know exactly what you mean about gummy, but when you bake bread with high hydration, you always have that crispy crust and the crumb is still somewhat wet, somewhat sticky. So if you don't want that, then you might have to reduce the uh, hydration a little bit. Jose and I have been chatting about this. We, we I think it was you, Jose, uh, I'm sorry if not, but uh, to me, the sourdough is this play of different consistency you have this uh, crispy crust, a little bit of this ear paired with a super soft inside. And I just feel this creates such an incredible uh, taste experience. So to me, having a soft crumb that's still a little bit wet, that's actually something that I strive for in every sourdough that I'm baking. Hope this answered your question and please send me the picture. Pai Lin Chu, can you use less starter, 10% instead of the typical amount, 12%? Yes, you can definitely do this. Uh, so when I make an overnight sourdough, actually this one, which I had in my hand just here where I'm about to make the recipe, I just wanna make sure that I get this right a few times before converting this into the video. I used 10% sourdough starter because I knew I was going to sleep for a little bit longer. And with my 20%, the dough would have been ready after uh, I think six hours, but with 10%, it was ready after around 10 hours. So that gave me plenty of time to make sure everything is perfectly right. I recently tried 1% sourdough and fermented over a few days at room temperature. That did not work because you have enzymes breaking down the moment your flour is getting into contact with water. And this means that your flour is going to deteriorate over some time. Just imagine you want to sprout something and uh, the chemistry inside of the seed has to adjust a little bit. And that's what's happening. So um, you get into a little bit of trouble when you ferment for, for way too long. But this also depends on room temperature and so on, of course. Hope this answered your question. Diego Valles. You made a 90% sourdough today and it was amazing. Congratulations, well done. <laughs> That's also what I like about making sticky doughs. It's more of a challenge. So good job. Uh, I saw some of your doughs before and they were just simply amazing. So good job, congrats. Um, yes, and when I make my everyday sourdough, the one which we also made today, I wouldn't go so high. Well, this one today, because I wanted to show you a little bit of something challenging, I went for 75% hydration plus around 2% coming from the stutter, I guess. I would normally go for 65% or so because that just makes things so much easier and you can even get a nice crumb from a stiffer dough. And uh, you don't have to go so crazy in terms of hydration. If you are a new sourdough baker, 
I would recommend to go a little bit lower because it makes things so much easier. All about my dog. You are most welcome. Uh, please ask me some more questions if you're interested. Um, Karen Roda, someday you hope to create a good year. <laughs> yeah, it's hitting the sweet spot of fermenting long enough, not over fermenting, um, getting that, that scoring exactly right. All the different factors uh, play into this. So there's one video on my account, which is about controlling the fermentation process. I recommend you to watch this uh, one more time. It's really about the fermentation process, making sure everything perfectly works. Jos, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, Robin Gogolog, uh, you are saying you're clicking tap in the uh, integrated development environment IDE, I guess, and it's making two spaces well, and you set it up properly. <laughs> That's also the way how it works. So uh, I'm always, just for you engineers, I like to program in this editor called Vim. Yeah, so that's my typical editor of choice. Uh, Redwood, would you get more regular crumb by degassing, shaping more violently? Yes. So we have done some pre-shaping today. This is going to even out the crumb and then also degassing the dough before with a very tight shaping that's also going to even out the crumb if this is something that you want. That's definitely the effects. Also more stretch and folds during the bulk fermentation process. Actually, I typically suggest you do one per hour, but in the past, I changed this a little bit. I'm just doing this whenever I feel the dough is ready. I might just be doing two stretch and folds over the whole bulk fermentation time. And my last one is now always around an hour or maybe one and a half hours before shaping because I feel this is even going to make a nicer wilder crumb. But if you don't want that, you could just be doing this more often. You will be adding strength, but you will also be evening out the crumb of your dough. Hope this answered your question. Uh, Jose, I bake bread for my family too, but your mother doesn't like thick and hard crust. Any advice to get it softer? Jose, I have been there. Uh, I know the struggle. I love that crust, but also some of my family members, they don't like it. And the trick is just to bake with steam the complete time. If you have a Dutch oven, just keep the lid of the Dutch oven on the whole time or uh, just make sure that you have enough steam inside of your oven. You will get a very, very soft uh, crust. Mzoli, 1,222. Using whole meal flour around 20%. I feel like the brand pokes the gluten network, resulting in an almost flat bread. But the flavor is really amazing. Valid point. Um, actually, the dough I was making today has around 20% whole wheat flour. And yes, I noticed this too from happening. Some viewers have suggested that you should ext extract the bran from the flour. That way it does not get pierced that much. So maybe that could be an option, but then you also have to buy something like, oh, I don't know the English word for this. Zip, I for forgot it. I'm so sorry. Some, some device where you can filter out some parts, like a mesh. I think a mesh is the proper name. Um, and I agree, the flavor is really amazing. Actually, my favorite bread is with 20% rye flour, not whole wheat, but rye flour. I don't know, it's, I think it's also called a French country bread, but this is just so amazing in terms of taste. Joss S. so if you want a super tangy sardo, you won't get Govon Spring. Yes, pretty much, you said it. <laughs> um, I would actually, when you want to do that, I would opt for using a loaf pan. It's just going to make things uh, so much easier for you. Super tangy sourdough, oven spring, nope, that's not really going to work. Unless you might also be using a very, 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 very stiff dough. Um, that could possibly work, but if you wanted to make the super tang, then go for a loaf pan. So redwood, okay. You don't want the oven spring, but you don't want you don't want big holes to make it easier to spread. Ah, okay, yes, um, yes. You would get the oven spring. So his question was, um, or your question was, 
he he or she you <laughs> want to even out the crumb a little bit and because the else when you put in some butter or so it just goes through pockets yes what you want to do is you just want to do more stretch and folds during the bulk fermentation stage or you just want to degas uh, the dough while shaping and yes actually by doing so you're going to create a much tighter shape and you might even get more oven spring plus you will get a more even crumb so i think that's a win-win situation for you right there Danville, does the pH strip help in identifying too much S in your Sardo starter? Danville, yes, I have actually done this before, um, but then I got tired of it because I always had to recalibrate my, I had a small machine a device to measure it and I just got tired of it. Yes, you can definitely do this. I don't have the right numbers. I think it, my Sardo starter even at some point had something like 4.5, could that be? Um, what I just do is, I just feed my sourdough starter with less initial starter. So I would be using 10 grams of starter, 50 grams of flour, 50 grams of water or so. That's a one to five to five ratio. That's why I get the acidity a little bit down. So many great questions from all of you. You guys are really asking amazing questions. <laughs> I hope I'm answering them uh, correctly. So, all about my dog so he's asking you're asking um is to do the stretch and folds important nope it totally is not important um it well it depends on <laughs> what you're trying to do it always depends i'm so sorry now if you have created a lot of strength inside of your dough by kneading by doing a lot of kneading then the stretch and folds the only purpose of the stretch and folds is to add more strength to your dough and to even out um, the pockets of air a little bit. Now, if you omit all that, if you don't do any stretch and folds at all, chances are you might not have created enough dough strength. But you, if, if you did enough kneading, then it's not required. But you would also end up with very, very wide, big pockets of air instead of your, your end product if you um, don't degas the dough before. Now, if you degas the dough completely before shaping anyways, because you want to make a baguette or so, which doesn't have an open crumb, then don't worry about, don't worry about the stretch and folds at all. This is most important when you are <coughs> looking to make this uh, open crumb sourdough bread. Hope this answered your question. Um, Diego, Diego. You're making 90% hydration sourdough at 24C. So Diego, right now here in my flat, it's uh, it's 25 degrees Celsius and you have 24 degrees Celsius. And for me, it takes around, I would say five to six hours to be ready. So I would be looking at six hours provided that your sourdough is as active as mine. Every sourdough is also always a little bit unique. So. My sardo could be faster than your sardo, or your sardo could be faster than mine. That's what makes it so tricky when you see numbers and times. They're always just a recommendation, but it does not mean that they will work exactly for you because every sardo really is unique. So that makes it so challenging and so hard. Adi Chada, for sardo, you're asking, uh, what's the best flour to use in Canada. I know that in Canada, very popular is the Manitoba flour. I know uh, that Caputo mill from Italy is also using it. Um, just make sure that you try to find flour which has a lot of um, uh, protein, ideally. That's going to make it a little bit easier. Hope this answered your question. Pai Lin Chu, thanks, man. Yes, you are most welcome. And I see Poi Poisy, sorry for pronouncing your name, but also already uh, answered this. Um, where do you throw away your discard? <laughs> Teach me guitar. No, I'm using my sourdough discard. And just to prove this, let me show you. <laughs> I have been making a nice discard starter bread with lots of seeds. Um, I typically wait until I have gathered around one kilo of discard starter. And then this is what I'm baking. And it's going to be a nice 
seed next to seed bread, very German style. We love this kind of bread. And it's also a little bit more sour. It has a nice tang. It's one of my favorite breads. Uh, Vasily, sometimes uh, you are baking for 25 minutes in, in a casserole and you don't get a crunchy crust. Well, casserole, I guess it's similar to a Dutch oven. Well, the steam is trapped inside. Remove the lid and then you should be getting a crusty crust. It's a myth that steam is not it, that steam is creating a crust. The crust is always coming from the Maillard reaction happening when you have a lot of heat. So um, just make sure that uh, you remove the lid so that you have not that much steam and then you should be getting that crust. Candy car 700. Do you have to change it? The dough starts expanding as soon as you get it out of the wood foam. Also, if you do a bench kneading and a lamination, would I only into one coil fold? Uh, for what do you have to change? Okay. So basically, Kemi uh, Car 700 is asking, he's, uh, ha he's having, or he or she is having a, um, a container with a dough, and then you take it out and the dough starts flattening out right away. Um, try, to do, uh, try to do a window pane test. So take some of the dough before you take it out and see if it actually holds together. I just always mix flour and water. It's called the autolys. And if it does not, chances are that you might be using too much water for your flour. So the water content really depends on the flour that you're using. Hope this answered your question. Um, for softer crust, you can store the finished bread in a Ziploc bag. Teach me guitar. Haha, <laughs> yes. Valid point. That's actually what I'm doing. I'm storing my bread inside of a Ziploc bag inside of my fridge. That way it just stays good for a few weeks and I can take all my time to eat it. I know it might not be the best, but I just don't like it when some of my food goes bad. So that's, that's what I do. Redwood, yes. Sift out the brand to avoid piercing. Exactly, that's going to help. So, BG Vern Canada says, some video I watched suggest dusting with cornmeal. How do you feel about that? Yes, you could definitely do that. I don't see that, I, I wouldn't say that's bad. Some use semolina flour, some use corn flour. Um, I wouldn't know what's the difference between semolina and corn flour. I use rice flour because rice absorbs a lot of hydration, just like if you uh, threw your smartphone into the toilet and uh, you want to make sure it dries a little bit, put it into a bag of rice. So that's why rice flour, um, I know works very well. But corn flour, sure, you can also definitely try this. Ali, it says baking powder. Yes, you could of course be using the baking powder as well to remove some of the acidity if you want to. <laughs> Redwood, have you ever made machine yeast sourdough bread? Yes, I have many, many times. And that's actually also how I started. But I just feel that the most important tool for baking great bread is you need to use your hands. You need to understand how the dough feels throughout the process. Now a machine works if you have a good dough hook, but you will not learn this feel for the dough. And that's why I suggest to not use a machine at, at the start. And actually my machine also doesn't have that good of a dough hook, so it doesn't really need the dough as well as it should. Poi poisy. Can you make a video just on signs of fermentation or so we know how to move on to the next stage? Yes, um, so I have a video on my YouTube account called the number one secret to getting more oven spring, I think. Uh, it's just two breads next to each other. That one is pretty good. But I also have another video coming up soon uh, on just controlling the proofing and discussing different methods of proving the dough in the end. But yeah, I feel fermentation is something that I should also discuss more in detail, maybe looking at different type setups and so on. Thanks for the suggestion. <coughs> Harley Baldwin, hi again, you just arrived late. No worries, hi, thanks for also joining. How's it going? All about my dog, you make pancakes with this discard. Yes, very good idea. You can also make sourdough crackers out of it. They're gonna be a hit on the next party. Uh, sourdough crackers, 
delicious. You can season them with some rosemary, some thyme, or other herbs, whatever you prefer. And they're just like chips, pretty much. They're really, really good. <laughs> Harley Baldwin. No, I didn't try it yet, but I actually got me a small tool to try exactly that. But before, I just want to try using my other method one more time just to see because I feel I was so close. I was maybe just not using enough steam or so during the baking process, but then that's going to be part of the next video for sure. Um, Bai Lin Chun, if the dough is sticking when you're doing the lamination, do you dust the surface with flour? Nope, 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 nope. You only dust the dough <coughs> with, um, you only dust the surface with flour during the shaping stage. You want to use that stickiness. And if you have bigger issues with this, then I recommend to get a, a bench scraper. Then you can really remove the dough from the surface. But by having the dough stick to the surface, you can just take the dough, pull it out very, very far, and then fold it over. So the stickiness is really an integral part to create more strength. Now, if you feel it's getting too sticky, just let it sit there for 15 minutes and then try again. That should also be already doing a good trick. Miriam. <laughs> yes, you can also throw it in the trash, of course, if you want to. That's definitely okay too. I know some people do this, but personally, I just like to use whatever I have at hand. And if you think about it, the discard is very, very, very much fermented flour. So it's almost like eating a camembert where you have raw cow milk and that's just fermented. So it's really broken down flour. And I feel this is something that has a uh, nutritious value. So I personally, I like to use it, to, to eat it, to do something with it. Sam, hey Sam, how are you doing? Uh, hello, nice baking skills from a random German. Thank you very much. That really means a lot. Uh, all about, no, Harley, Harley. Any flour with no gluten will work for Benetting Dustin. Uh, but I also just sometimes use my regular all purpose flour or my whatever flour I have available. And that also worked for me. What I like to do is I like to dust the dough a little bit with flour before placing it in the pan. And that's typically also a quite good trick. Uh, but rice flour, in my opinion, is just the superior flour for dusting your your banneton. Is there actually people who have allergies against rice flour? I I, I don't know. <clears throat> Karen Rodas. I just made crackers with a discard. Hobby loves it. Nice. Awesome. Yes, the crackers are amazing. I love making sourdough discard crackers. They are really super delicious. I could only agree. Um, was, yeah, Redwood said, laminate on a slightly wet surface. Yes, when you laminate your dough and your surface is slightly wet, that's going to make it easier but also you will not be adding as much strength because you want your dough to stick to the surface. Now, you can't pull it out so far if your, uh, your surface is wetted. So that makes it a little bit trickier to laminate, just something that you have to, uh, to, yeah, to, to take into consideration as well. Vasiliki, yes, rice flour, just putting rice in the blender. Exactly, that's pretty much what I did. I have my grain mill and there I just put in some rice and ground it. That's how I got my, my rice flour. But some people are saying it's called, I think, dark rice flour or something in the US. Don't, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm a disaster human. Um, so Johnny, I would keep a started going for making Sardo discard crackers alone. They're that good. I'm making them for my neighbors now. I just discovered your channel. I love it. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Johnny. That really means a lot. Thank you so much. That really warms my heart. Uh, yeah, you all are amazing. Thanks for supporting me on this exciting journey. It's, uh, it's so much fun. So yeah, I, I don't know at the end of the year, I think I already said, I'll be just trying to join a local bakery. Unfortunately, one rejected my application right now, <laughs> maybe because I said I'm gonna work for free. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, 
or I think it's also the COVID situation right now. That's why they don't want any other people. But yeah, I'm trying to find something and just work in the bakery for fun, um, uh, just for a little bit. But let's see how that's going to turn out. I'm really trying to want to learn how to scale things up because right now I'm just making a few loaves per week. How can you make that a thousand loaves or so? And what are the what are the the negative aspects of this? So now I can make a really nice open crumb bread. Can you still do that at scale? <clears throat> what are basically the limits of industrial baking or large scale baking? That's what I'm trying to uh, figure out. Marek, Marek asked, hey Marek, how are you doing? No, no worries, this has not been asked before. Have you ever, have you, do you know a difference in uh, coarse ground flour versus finer flours in terms of fermentation times? Nope, I have not noticed a difference in this. Just one note, whole wheat flour, there's more nutrients for your sourdough. So I guess that the sourdough is able to reproduce more inside of a whole wheat flour. Actually an interesting thought. So maybe when you're fermenting with whole wheat flour inside of your mix, um, your fermentation times, yeah, could actually uh, could could decrease because there's more food for the yeast and for the bacteria. Would make perfect sense. Gordon F, your crumb is gummy even after cutting when it's cooled down. What do you think it's wrong? Underbaked? Hmm, excellent question. So is it like that you have areas inside of the crumb that are still like layers of stickiness? Is that, is that the case or what is the case? Because when you make a bread with high hydration, you always have somewhat of a, a, a wet <coughs> crumb in the end still. And I personally feel that this is a great combination of flavor with the crispy crust and the wet crumb. So if you don't like this, I would recommend to maybe lower the hydration a little bit or bake a little bit longer, just like you said. Um, all about my dog. Is it okay? I have this guard started and then I fed it, put it into the fridge plane to feed every week. That is okay. Just leave your discard starter in the week in the fridge for a week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month or so. Um, there's gonna be some liquid on top. You can just remove that, but it can easily sit in the fridge for a very, very, very long time. And it's an environment where no other bacteria likes to go inside because it's just too sour. So um, I don't see an issue. After some time, it might be that the yeast and the bacteria naturally dies instead of just discard sourdough starter, just like when you're making wine. Also then the yeast dies at some point and the bacteria also. PZ Pierce, yes, you bake the discard in a skillet to make delicious flat bread. It's so amazing that everybody's here. Uh, I guess we are for everybody from around the world. I know one is from Malaysia. I know one is from Washington. I know one is from Argentine, one from Spain. <laughs> it's really cool how this is uniting everybody, the quest to baking amazing sourdough bread. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Pori Poisy, do you use a mock mill? Yes, I use a mock mill. That's a special kind of mill. I'm using a mock mill. Rapsi Papsi, can't believe I'm sitting here watching your live stream, but well, I am a fan of your work, appreciating it. Greetings from Hamburg. Wow, another Hamburgian. Moin, was geht ab? Ich komme aus Finkwada. Ich habe noch Plattdeutsch lernt zu Hause. I was just speaking a very, very weird German, uh, uh, a local German dialect, which my... Uh, grandfather used to speak it's from a small fishing village he used to be a, a fisherman and it's a language which is no longer spoken but my grandpa was only able to speak this language <laughs> Rapsi Papsi, have you ever tried baking break tried baking break with bread with dinkle flour uh spelt flour uh no i've actually never tried it i've not started working with spelt yet because i feel i just want to make this one recipe perfect first before starting something new. So I'm just baking my set basic set of breads pretty much just changing a few parameters every time. I wanna make sure I master that before moving on to something else. 
at the start, I was trying all sorts of different things, but then I figured, okay, focus, try to get this one thing right. And I would say that's my signature bread now, this open crumb fluffy bread. So I'm still trying to master that, trying to make that better. And probably I made 2000 attempts already on just that particular <laughs> recipe with slight parameter changes every time. So, uh, so, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Harley Baldwin, he's talking about sifting flour. Yes, that's something you can do when you bake with whole wheat, just sift uh, out some bran to not pierce the gluten network. So yeah, definitely something you, you can try. Um, what, Biker T, you have what you said. You took a loaf of your sardo to a nearby bakery and you got a job there. <laughs> I'm going to try that. I'm going to walk up to my favorite bakery and show them a piece of my bread. I'm going to show them a very, very flat bread, like a super, super failed bread. And I said, hey, you got a job for me? <laughs> <laughs> Kami Curry, 700. Awesome. You are most welcome. Glad I was able to help. So uh, you tested reducing the hydration a little bit. It passed the window pane test. Good job. Don't use too much water for your flour. Every flour requires a different level of water. Okay. Um, uh, Redwood, I don't... Um, I'm not sure if this is stated in the fermentation table. So I did not develop this fermentation table on my own. I just made it a little bit prettier and more user-friendly. I shared the original link in there. There's also a link to all the models and all the assumptions, which is very, very technical if you're interested to see the whole model hiding behind this. But yeah, it makes sense that maybe um, whole wheat is a little faster. Makes, yeah, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Danville, yes, wow, yes, exactly. So one trick, very good trick. Uh, just to make sure that you know that your bread is ready, just take a thermometer. <laughs> Ein uh, braten thermometer and put it into your bread and you can measure the temperature. And just like Danville said, excellent comment, uh, wait until it's 96 degrees Celsius and you're ready to roll. <laughs> Rio Diaz, have you ever baked starting with uh, Oh, <laughs> first of all, teach me guitar. Okay, that's awesome. I did not know. Opening up a micro bakery, that's nice. Promise here in Germany, I feel there are so many food regulations. Um, it's a little more complicated to just sell sell food here. But yeah, I also want to sleep. That's a little bit the problem why I don't want to <laughs> open up a bakery. I like to travel and I like to sleep. And uh, I feel working as a baker full-time, maybe it's not as fulfilling as having this just as a hobby. That's what I'm a little bit nah, on this thought. Um Rio Diaz, have you ever baked within a cold oven? No, I've never tried baking with a cold oven. It's just one thing which I took for granted. Now that I'm now I'm doubting myself, maybe I should try this. What's the difference? Marek, do you have any other do-it-yourself interests other than baking? Yes, I love to make uh, soap, for instance. I'm uh, currently doing a little bit of beer brewing, trying to get better at beer brewing. And of course, I love uh, programming. And I also recently discovered I love to do a little bit of gardening. I don't know. It's also very nice to just see your vegetables growing. Johnny Washek, San Diego, California. Awesome. Greetings to San Diego, California. I love the city. I've been there twice. It's just an amazing city. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gordon F, you're welcome. Rio Diaz, greetings from Los Angeles, California. Hello, hello to LA. <laughs> ben van den Troost, greetings from Antwerpen. Your baking tips are great. I love it that you explain it the principle, not just the recipe. Thank you so much. I feel bad about it sometimes because my videos are so long, but I personally, I can't handle a recipe where the why is not explained. So to me, 
I always have to understand the why I should do something. Um, that's to me much, 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 much more important than just blindly following a recipe. So yes, why should I do something? That's really what, what I feel needs to be mentioned in order to turn a, a recipe into a great recipe. But I also feel bad sometimes. I don't want to talk your ear off in the videos, but I feel the, the why is uh, missing sometimes. That's why my videos are a little bit longer typically. And also because I'm just such a baking nerd. <laughs> Gloria, uh, yes, I might be sharing it if I actually get the job. Maybe I shouldn't say I do it for free. Maybe I should uh, just say I take a little bit of money because maybe people feel that somebody who does it for free is a bad idea. But I'll definitely keep going until the end of this year and uh, try promoting some more good baking tutorials. Next year, I don't know, let's see, I'm just planning to do uh, one bread video per week until end of this year. <laughs> Denville, what kind of notes do you keep on your baking results? So I'm a software engineer and what I like to do is I like to um, keep track in a scientific way. I'm using something which is called Git. It's called a versioning tool. There you can just take note of all the iterations that you're doing and you even have a history of all the changes you did. So it will show you exactly you changed this line, you replace it with that line in the recipe and so on. It's a great way to just uh, keep uh, track of everything. And I like to, of course, take a lot of pictures and some videos. Tom Nelson, spell is similar to wheat, but it has more gluten, I just checked, and of a different kind. Interesting, I did not know. I also know in Germany we call this Urdinke, uh, like old spelt, which is very different than the, 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 the modern spelt. So I think modern spelt is quite similar in terms of properties to wheat, but there are so many different kinds of spelt, so I might also be wrong. So, Redwood, the original way it states that. So yes, we were talking about fermentation times for a whole wheat flour. That whole wheat flour ferments a little faster than white flour. And uh, he just checked the original fermentation table, which I linked in my fermentation table states that. So interesting. Now the question is why? Why is that the case? Maybe you can set, shed some light on this. Would be interesting to know. <laughs> Son of the cakes, it's still life. Uh, and you finished three kilometers running. Wow, you run three kilometers, I run 10 meters. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Robert, Pauli, Robert, how's it going? I hope you're great. <laughs> I have a sourdough in the fridge to prove overnight. Thinking of making bagels tomorrow. Any tips? Whew, I have never made uh, bagels, but I know that some of my American colleagues are really crazy about bagels. That could be another interesting topic to explore, but I'm not an expert on bagels. I'm sorry. But if you have a sour in the fridge to prove overnight, then you might want to bake it directly in the morning, I guess. Is the camera a little blurry right now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, please brew for us a dunkles Weizenbier. You like a wheat-based ale. Oh yes, wheat-based ale is nice. I really enjoy Bavarian beer, they're amazing. Poi Poisy, tech question. How are you filming in the workspace from above so we can see? I have a small webcam, which I am using. It took me a while to get this webcam though, um, because everything was sold out during the COVID times. Christian Semmler, Chris, was geht up? <laughs> yes, I can imagine. You have some nice dill and parsley. Awesome. Uh, I still have to visit you in your new house. Zoli, greetings from Hungary. <laughs> greetings back. Hello, how's it going? So, <laughs> uh, son of the cakes, you're fat and lazy, it's for your diet. <laughs> uh, yeah, I should be doing a little bit more running too. Okay, so um, it's already been one and a half hours. I will just be showing you one more time the breads that we made so that you can see what we did. And if you're interested, I will be showing you a picture of them uh, tomorrow. Let me just move this to the side a little bit. It's been a lot of fun. First of all, it's been a lot of fun with everybody. Thank you so much for all the great questions. I hope I was able to clarify a few things. And yeah, thanks for being a, a loyal subscriber. It was awesome to chat with everybody of you from around the world. Uh, it's uh, just 
amazing. It's a nice uh, bread community. So I'm just gonna take my webcam now and just rotate this one more time downwards. Oops. Not chat related style. <laughs> so bread number one. And it already increased a little bit. And now we will be doing the finger poke test. Take a little bit of flour and just poke into the dough like this. And you can see there is a dent and it's still recovering relatively fast. So this bread is definitely not ready yet. It still requires some more proofing. I will keep doing this uh, every 15 minutes or so until I feel it's ready. And then there's this new technique, which I like to do. I'll also make a video on this soon, which is I just take this, put this into the freezer for 30 minutes and uh, then I bake it directly in the already preheated oven. So the finger poke test really does wonders. <laughs> uh, yes, all right. So I guess that's, uh, that's uh, how to end it. Keep proofing your dough, use the finger poke test. It's amazing. And um, yeah, if you have questions, always feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help. That's already late in Germany. Thanks everybody for, uh, for, for joining and uh, take care, cheers. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Oh, I also only have twelve percent battery left. <laughs> See ya. You're most welcome, everybody. <laughs>